Hello everyone, and welcome to our online lecture for Psych 1101 and Psych 1010 at Lanier Technical College. My name is Michael Holman, I am a psychology instructor here at Lanier Tech, and I will be your narrator. Please note that these lectures are intended to assist you in better understanding the material, and should not be considered a substitute for attending lecture, reading the text, or completing your assignments. With that said, let's talk about methods of therapy. So this time around we're going to define psychotherapy and describe the history of treatment. We will describe traditional psychoanalysis and short-term psychodynamic theories. We will define humanistic therapy and contrast its two main approaches, define behavior therapy and identify various behavioral approaches to therapy. We will define cognitive therapy and describe Beck's approach and REBT. And we will identify advantages, disadvantages, and types of group therapy. We will explain whether psychotherapy works and who benefits from it and describe methods of biological therapy and their benefits and side effects. So true or false? Residents of London used to visit the insane asylum for a fun night out on the town. That is true. Some psychotherapists let their clients take the lead in psychotherapy. That is also true. Some psychotherapists tell their clients exactly what to do. That is also true. Lying in a reclining chair and fantasizing can be an effective way of confronting fears. That is also true. Smoking cigarettes can be an effective method for helping people stop smoking cigarettes. That is also true. There is no scientific evidence that psychotherapy helps people with psychological disorders. That is false. The originator of a surgical technique to reduce violence learned that it was not always successful when one of his patients shot him. That is true. So what is psychotherapy? Well, it is the systematic interaction between client and therapist. It is based on psychological principles and it influences clients' thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Clients use it for psychological disorders, adjustment problems, and or personal growth. There are, there's a long history when it comes to therapy. Therapy first started in mental asylums. These were just places where if you were considered inconvenient, if you had what we called a disorder, if people thought you were possessed, we would just throw you in an asylum. You didn't get any help. You were just locked away to keep out of sight. And what's interesting is that, especially in London, uh, it was common practice for people to pay the keepers of these asylums, and then members of the town would just walk through the asylum and they would look at all the crazy people and see that they were chained up, that they might be going through a manic episode, that they might be screaming at voices that no one else can see or hear. Uh, any number of things like that. So it wasn't exactly helpful for people with these conditions. Later, asylums gave way to mental hospitals. So mental hospitals are really not any better than asylums. Uh, we would say that we were helping you, that we were treating you, but really this was just an awful ground for us to uh, conduct horrible experiments on people, things like lobotomies and things of that nature which you'll learn about later towards the end of this lecture. Uh, also, just like in asylums, people often would use mental hospitals as a way to get rid of people that were inconvenient. So if they were a little bit eccentric, or if they were the inheritors of money or a large piece of land, it was very easy to get someone sent to the asylum, and then you didn't have to deal with them anymore and you got whatever they were the owners of because they were mentally unfit. Today, the modern approach is the community mental health movement. So this is a very different approach because most of our clinics are actually outpatient clinics. Outpatient clinics are like going to the doctor's office or the dentist's office. You go in, you have your therapy, you get your treatment, and then you leave, you go home. We do also have inpatient treatment centers for uh, clients that are in need of a little more intensive care, but these are all done entirely voluntarily. And 
most people can leave at any time unless they are judged to be suicidal or possibly homicidal. So before we begin on psychoanalytic therapies, I also want to take note of this picture. Here is an example of Londoners having a nice night out on the town by visiting the local insane asylum. So you can see that people are uh, locked up, things of that nature. And you'll also notice that, for example, this young woman is being detected or depicted uh, just being posed and things of that nature. If you recall from the psychological disorders chapter, she was most likely experiencing waxy flexibility. And so they were demonstrating her waxy flexibility to the interested uh, crowd of onlookers. So that's a way that we often would be using victims of psychological disorders for our own entertainment. But now we're going to talk about psycholytic and psychoanalytic therapies. So traditional psychoanalysis involves insight, catharsis, free association, resistance, and transference. Insight, you already know about by now, that's that light bulb above the head. Catharsis, however, is when you release your anger or any emotion that you have through physical activity. So if you're angry, you might hit a pillow or punch the wall or beat on a punching bag, anything like that. It's considered cathartic. Free association, you've heard of before. These are those Rorschach tests and the TAT tests. So you just see an image and you say the first thing that comes to mind. Resistance is very interesting because resistance is when you're in a therapy session and I bring up, say, your dad and you say, I don't want to talk about my dad. You know, why do we always talk about my dad? Why don't we talk about you? We always talk about me. Why don't we talk about you? Or you change the subject, right? So resistance is when you go out of your way as the client to resist talking about a particular subject. As a good therapist, it is my duty then to talk about that subject. Whatever you don't want to talk about, that's what we're going to make you talk about. That is resistance. Transference is something that Freud often called the ultimate goal of therapy. Transference is when the client starts transferring their feelings for someone else onto their therapist because their therapist is a safe target. So for example, if they are resentful of their parents but they don't feel comfortable admitting that, they might start being resentful towards the therapist. Or if they're in love with their best friend, they might, they might start showing feelings of love towards their therapist because the therapist is a safe target whereas their best friend might not be. And so once we catch that transference is going on, then we can address it and figure out, well, where are these emotions really coming from? Who do you really have feelings for? So for example, if I was in a session with someone and maybe I questioned them on an idea that they had about someone and their response was to say, well, you know, you never support me. You never like any of my ideas. You always shoot down every idea I've ever had. And we just have this long pause. This has happened in a therapy session for me. And I said, wait a second, I've only known you for about three weeks. How can I shoot down any idea that you've ever had? And so it turned out they really didn't have those feelings about me. They had them about their business partner. They simply transferred them onto me because I was a safe target. You probably also heard of dream analysis. Freud would often say that this was wish fulfillment. Whatever you were dreaming about was what you really wanted. A lot of therapies used today are known as short-term dynamic therapies. They are shorter, they're less intense, and they're more directive. They also do something called ego analysis, where they focus more on your ego and less on your id. So more focus on the current you, less on your uh, unconscious instincts or urges. Interpersonal psychotherapy focuses on the present rather than childhood relationships. This is something that is also different from what Freud did. So it's a more modern view. Insight-oriented therapy, of course, involves psychoanalytic theory, which follows the id, the superego, and the ego. You hopefully remember that from the personality chapter. And is the theory of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy. It touts the benefits of personal insight and says that insight is obtained by developing awareness of unconscious thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Several techniques of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapies include free association, dream analysis, 
interpretation of defense mechanisms, resistance, transference, all sorts of things. So psychoanalysis was founded by Freud, and he said that the root of all of our problems is in unconscious conflicts. That this is because of an imbalance in our id, our ego, and our superego, and that conscious insight can resolve these conflicts. Special therapy techniques may be used like free association, dream interpretation, and interpretation of resistance. You might also use transference, catharsis, and we've also found that interpersonal psychotherapy really does work for depression. It first started to treat depression with Freud, and it identifies sources of depression and goals for the therapeutic process. We've actually found very successful outcomes from this, so this is another example of how therapy really does work. So let's look at psychoanalysis versus psychodynamic. The first thing that you might notice is that psychoanalysis is on the left, psychodynamic is on the right. With psychoanalysis, the client is laying down, and you can think of it this way, you're laying down because you're gonna be there for a while. Psychoanalysis will dive into your childhood. It dives into your unconscious motives, and so you are gonna be coming to therapy sessions for months and even years at a time, over and over again. With psychodynamic therapies, you're sitting in the chair. You're not gonna be there for too long, just an hour session a few times for a couple of months and then you're good to go. So these sessions usually have much shorter term goals, whereas you can have long term goals with psychoanalysis because you've got a lot of time to work with. The other major concern is insurance. Insurance is not usually going to pay for psychoanalysis because we're basically saying this person is going to come to therapy for one hour a week for the rest of their lives. Probably. So insurance isn't willing to pay for that. But psychodynamic therapy, we usually get a lot about four to eight sessions, which can be anywhere from one to two months of working with a client, usually. Uh, so that's what insurance is willing to pay for, and so we make shorter term goals and try to teach them the skills that they need in that moment so that they maybe can go on to do better things and overcome their problems on their own. We're more like teachers and less like shepherds. The treatment is far more intense in psychoanalysis than it would be in psychodynamic therapies as well. So now let's talk about humanistic therapies. First we have client-centered therapy. The big name here is Carl Rogers and this sort of therapy provides insight into parts of us we have disowned so that we may feel whole. It is non-directive, so you drive. It is warm, and it has a therapeutic atmosphere. It also is all about unconditional positive regard. So no matter what you do, no matter what you've done, I'm not going to judge you as your therapist. This is actually incredibly important because many people are dealing with issues that they hate to admit to people, let alone to a complete stranger. And so they might be afraid, and it might be why they haven't talked to friends or family, that you're gonna judge them. So by making sure they know that nothing they say or do is going to ma allow me to judge them, then they feel more willing to open up and tell me the truth. And I can't really make any progress and help you unless you tell me the truth. So it becomes very important. Client centered therapy also uses empathy. Now, a lot of people get empathy and sympathy confused. Think of it this way. Sympathy is focused on yourself. It is how you would feel in a situation if you were in that situation. Empathy is recognizing the emotions of the person you're talking to. So for example, I once had a client who was dealing with depression and she was going through a divorce. They were in the process. And then one day she comes in and she goes, well, he's completely moved out and all of the divorce papers have been signed. Sympathy response would be, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I know that must be tough for you. Because that might be how I would feel if my relationship was ending. Empathy, however, is recognizing that she was ecstatic. She was so excited that he was gone. She was like, he is gone. I never have to see his ugly face again. I don't have to deal with him not putting up the dishes anymore or cheating on me or anything like that. 
So she was ecstatic that he was gone, and I needed to recognize that, that that's how she felt about the situation, not how I would feel about the situation. And we also need to be genuine with client-centered therapy. They need to think, as a client, that what I'm saying, I believe in. That I'm not just throwing them a line or treating them like another client or you know, just another customer. That this person matters to me. And what I say, I'm saying to really try and help them. So this can be very difficult, but it's important that they trust us at every level. And that's what Carl Rogers was really famous for. Gestalt therapy is another form of humanistic therapy. The big name is Fritz Perls, and it integrates conflicting parts of your personality. It is very directive and it is focused on the here and now. Gestalt therapy is very imagination heavy. It's all about uh, role playing and pretending that people are in the room with you. We call one technique the empty chair technique, where we say that we have the person you want to say all this stuff to that you're struggling with, I have them tied to this chair, bound and gagged. They cannot say or do anything. Nothing bad will happen if you admit your feelings to them right now. So go ahead, let it out. And so what's great about it is when we're doing these sort of role play activities with Gestalt therapy, we're actually creating a plan we now, in some way, have experienced both the best case and worst case scenario, and we can learn to adapt to it. So it can be very useful, but you've got to be willing to commit to the imagination requirement. An almost direct opposite of Gestalt therapy is behavior therapy. Behavior therapy applies the principles of learning to directly promote desired behavioral changes. It does things like conditioning and observational learning, and it's used to discontinue self-defeating behaviors like uh, jumping to conclusions or uh, eating fast food as a coping mechanism or even smoking. One way that we'll use behavior theories is with fear reduction methods. One method we'll use is systematic desensitization where you confront various forms of various stimuli and you are counter-conditioned to eventually overcome that fear. So for example, I once had a client that when she was a little girl, she was making hot dogs, she was boiling hot dogs rather, and she'd done this a million times. She was home alone, but for whatever reason, she accidentally hit the pot of boiling hot dogs and spilled it all over her body. She had horrible third degree burns over her entire body. Her burns were so bad that she was in the hospital for months and she had multiple skin grafts, multiple surgery, she even went to a burn survivors camp. Today she's mostly healed, she has a few scars still, but one of those scars is a mental scar. She developed an overwhelming phobia of boiling water to the point where one day she came home and she saw her roommate making mac and cheese and when he was draining the noodles of the hot water that's when she walked into the door. And as soon as she saw him draining the noodles, she had a complete meltdown. She completely freaked out because she just knew that he was going to spill it, that it was going to burn him, any number of things. So that was her phobia. So she came to me because, sure, she'd been dealing with it for a long time, but she hadn't really addressed it. And now she had no choice because she had just started a new job. She'd been trying to get a job for a long time and she finally got one. It was working in a restaurant in the kitchen of a uh, amusement park. And she'd been able to avoid this one responsibility up until this point, but she knew at some point she was going to have to do this because everyone had to do it. At some point, she was going to have to empty out the vat of fry grease at the end of the day. You can imagine how someone with a fear of boiling water would not want to do this. And she just knew if she refused to do it, she was going to get fired. So she came to me to see if we could help her with overcoming this fear of boiling water. And we used systematic desensitization. So we started out by me asking her to imagine a pot of boiling water in her head. Just imagine it. Close her eyes and pretend it's there. And I asked her on a scale of one to seven, how bad is your anxiety right now? And she said a six, just from pretending it was there. And so we would then practice our relaxation techniques, which we used over and over again. And so the idea was that 
just imagining the pot of boiling water while she was already in a relaxed state would eventually condition her to be relaxed when thinking about the pot of boiling water instead of being afraid. And then we would move on to maybe a picture or a video of boiling water. And then eventually we would have her in a kitchen with an actual pot of boiling water and pouring it out herself. That was the ultimate goal. Uh, and all the while, of course, this would take a very long time. This would be a very long process. But she would eventually overcome her fear. Systematic desensitization has proven to be highly effective in treating people with phobias. In fact, we often will use it in another way as well, using modern technology with virtual therapy. This is where we will put you in a virtual reality uh, set of equipment and you do the same thing, whether it's boiling water or dealing with dogs, whatever your fear is, and it can also help you to overcome it. Modeling is very similar to systematic desensitization, but now you are watching someone else do it. And so you see that nothing bad has happened. So for example, if you have a terrible fear of pit bulls, then we might bring a pit bull into the room with you. And of course, you're gonna be very upset in that moment, but then we have someone else play with the pit bull and you see that nothing happens. And so that shows you that the worst case scenario is not always going to happen. Another thing we will do in uh, behaviorism is aversive conditioning. It is to pair an aversive stimuli, so something you don't like, with the unwanted impulse. It is often used to eliminate unwanted habits and antisocial behaviors. For example, rapid smoking. Have you ever had a relative when you were younger, perhaps, that said, if I ever catch you smoking or I ever catch you drinking underage, I'm gonna make you drink the whole pack or smoke the whole pack. If you've ever had someone tell you they were gonna do that, or maybe they actually did it to you, then you know what happens next you get sick. And so when you get sick while smoking a cigarette, for example, you then are become conditioned to associate cigarettes with that nauseous, queasy feeling, that feeling like you're gonna throw up. And so what happens is that later, when you pick up a cigarette, you feel nauseous and so you don't smoke. And so sometimes one method of helping someone to quit smoking is to make them smoke even more. So every time they want one cigarette, we'll tell our clients to go out and smoke five cigarettes. And they keep doing that until the point where they have too much and all that nicotine makes them really sick and then they don't want it anymore. So it has proven to be very effective. We've also used methods like uh, electric shock or rubber bands, any number of things. So this is a very effective method as well. We also might use operant conditioning with the token economy saying that if you are not performing this behavior, if you do whatever it is you're trying to train yourself to do so many times, then you'll get a star or something like that. And then eventually you're able to reward yourself because you've been doing so well. We also will use success of approximation and biofeedback training. There's also social skills training. This decreases social anxiety and builds social skills through operant conditioning techniques, things like self-monitoring, behavior rehearsal, and feedback. We would do this often in a group therapy session that I ran that was about social anxiety on a college campus. So these were all usually freshmen or sophomores in college, and they were new, they didn't know anyone, and they were so shy that they weren't able to talk to other people, and they wanted to change. So one thing that we would do is we might give them a list of questions that were just simple standard questions that you could ask anyone to get, them know be to, to, get to know them better. So we might ask them questions like, what's your favorite color? What TV shows are you watching right now? What's your major? Do you like dogs or cats more? Stuff like that, very basic, simple stuff. And what we would do is we would have them split off into pairs and one person would practice reading the questions to their partner and the other person would then get the opportunity to practice answering those questions and then they would switch roles. And what was great about this exercise was that a lot of times these people were just so nervous about their situation that they were afraid that they were going to say the wrong thing. Or they were going to ask something stupid. And it's true, maybe they would have a weird answer for something because they're just that socially awkward. But if they did that in real life, someone would be like, wow, there's something wrong with you. But 
in our group setting, in our social skills group, nobody was going to judge them for it. It was normal. They could get good feedback on how maybe that's why you don't say that in a public situation. So it was very effective. And by the end of it, we would have them do a uh, social skills scavenger hunt where they actually went out onto the campus and talked to complete strangers and they had to ask them questions about themselves. So it was very interesting stuff. The next type of therapy we're going to talk about are cognitive therapies. Cognitive therapy is all about changing beliefs, attitudes, and automatic types of thinking that create and compound problems. It is all about becoming aware of your current cognitions. Remember, cognitive equals thinking. So it's all about being aware of your current thoughts. Aaron Beck first came up with cognitive therapy. And in his form of therapy, the client would confront feelings and beliefs that don't make any sense. They would become aware of cognitive errors. For example, if you have a friend and you're texting your friend and your friend doesn't respond, you might think, oh no, that person doesn't like me. And so then you start feeling sad or you start asking, what did I do? Why is it so wrong? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't have any evidence to prove that your friend doesn't like you. All you know is that your friend didn't text you back right away. So maybe there are other options. Maybe there are other reasons why someone didn't text you back. Maybe they're busy. So that's what we mean when we talk about cognitive errors, jumping to conclusions. Another form of cognitive therapy, one of my favorite forms of cognitive therapy, is rational emotive behavior therapy. Started by Albert Ellis, this is all about challenging irrational beliefs, your need for love and approval of others, your need to prove yourself to be competent, adequate, or achieving. Ellis was very famous for being very blunt, very matter-of-fact. He would just tell you exactly what it was. If he thought you had an irrational belief, he would say, that's stupid, you have an irrational belief. Just end up just very obvious in how he felt about what a client was going through uh, and how they were dealing with it. And that's not really great for every client. But for many clients, it does work. They need someone to be that direct with them. And that's what Albert Ellis was. And, people, therapists such as myself, also are. So Ellis also was very famous because he came up with two phrases. When someone says that they should do something or that they, so they should get all A's or they should get that job or they should arrive at work on time, you would say nobody is holding a gun to your head if you don't get all A's. You're shooting yourself. So you're adding uh, unnecessary uh, goals and requirements onto yourself. You don't have to have these things. Uh, another one would be, I must get all A's, or I must be liked by everyone that I meet. Ellis would say, no you don't. Nobody is going to kill you if they don't like you right away. That's not going to happen. You're now engaging in masturbation. So these were just silly little ways to help people to remember that sometimes we put a lot of requirements on ourselves that don't really help us, that are only hurting us in the long run. One of the most common forms of therapy, what I do, is cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. It is the integration of both behavioral and cognitive therapies. And that leads us to group therapy. So group therapy takes all of the different uh, types of therapies that we've talked about up until this point, and it applies them in different situations with different groups. So a group therapy session is one in which you have yourself and a whole bunch of other clients and maybe one or two uh, therapists there to help moderate the entire session. There are a lot of advantages to group therapies. They're economical, they more, have more experiences for you as the client to draw on, you have social support from your group, you are affiliated now with people that have similar issues. A lot of times, clients might think they are the only person that has ever dealt with this situation. And then they come to group therapy and they realize, oh wow, there's a lot of people that are dealing with this sort of problem. If you see someone else improving, it might provide hope for you. You think, oh wow, I saw John when we first started these group sessions and he was a nervous wreck and now he's so much better. If John can get better, surely I can get better. And it also helps to practice social skills in a safe environment, as we've talked about already. 
But the main disadvantage, the main drawback to group therapy sessions is that each individual is unable to express their feelings to the group. So if you're not comfortable sharing something with a whole bunch of people, then you probably won't. And also, a lot of times, some clients will want to completely monopolize everyone's time. Remember, this is a group session, so this is for everyone in the group. This is not just individual therapy with an audience. There are a number of different types of group therapy, aside from just regular group therapy, and they include couples therapy, which can help to improve communication and manage conflict, and also uses the CBT approach, so combining both behavioral and cognitive approaches, and family therapy, which now, instead of just the couple, is the whole family. And they often will use the systems approach. So the systems approach is asking each member of the family, how do you fit into the family? What's your role? And what your role is may change depending on who you talk to in that family. One person might view mom as the enforcer, as the warden, and someone else views mom as the safest person to talk to. Or maybe mom views herself as just somebody struggling to keep her head above water. So seeing everybody else's perspective can really help the family to understand how they can work together. So the question is, does psychotherapy actually work? The short version is yes. We have done meta-analyses and found that people who obtain psychotherapy fare far better than those who do not. There are certain specific factors, like having the support of an educated helping professional. You have someone that is trained to help you, and they're helping you. But there are also non-specific factors, like the client-therapist alliance. This is a relationship, like any other relationship, but this is a relationship dedicated to helping you improve your mental health. So you want to make sure that you trust your therapist, that you can enjoy them, that you are having a good time together. You also have to consider the type of therapy that you're doing. Remember, not everybody is going to like REBT. Not everybody is going to be comfortable with gestalt therapy. So you want to think, if you are thinking about doing therapy, what kind of therapy do they do? And also think about your problem. Many therapists are specially trained and have tons of experience in specific situations. So many therapists are specially trained in sexual assault. Other therapists are specially trained in dealing with gender identity issues. Other therapists are trained in dealing with anxiety. Others are really skilled at working with depression. So depending on what kind of problem you have, maybe you need to find a specific type of therapist. And finally, think about you as a patient. Are you the kind of patient that needs someone to stay on top of you at all times and make sure you get it done? Are you the kind of patient that if someone does stay on top of you, you're going to freak out and you're going to get angry at this person and become irrational and not want to come back? Well, think about that. Think about how you are as a person and what kind of therapy might work for you. And then you'll be much better prepared when choosing the right therapist. We also need to be multiculturally competent as a therapist because we are supposed to help people from all walks of life. And we need to understand that many people from many different cultures and backgrounds are going to struggle with things that we don't. For example, African Americans are known to cope with prejudice and discrimination far more than many other groups. Asian Americans, their culture tends to stigmatize people with disorders and therefore they will deny problems and not admit that they have an issue. Latino or Latina Americans will value family interdependence, which can conflict with the goal for self-reliance, and Native Americans have had a complete disruption of their traditional culture. So everybody's got special issues that they're having to deal with, and I need to be competent enough to help them no matter what their background is. Just because I don't come from that background, that's no excuse for me not to help this person. So how can I help them? By doing research. It is my ethical obligation to go out and learn more about the struggles of African Americans or learn more about the struggles of Asian Americans. Uh, you've been listening to my voice this whole time, but I'm a white man. So I've never known what it's like to, say, drive while black. Or I've never known what it's like for someone to accuse me of being um, an illegal immigrant. But many of my clients have had that experience. 
I don't need to have that experience in order to help them to cope with that experience. So being multiculturally competent is an essential part of any therapist training. Last, we're going to talk about biological therapies. So we, of course, need to talk about drugs. There are lots of anti-anxiety medications that can help, anti-psychotic medications that many schizophrenics will take. There are antidepressants that we've talked about before, like SSRIs. Lithium, which is a very strong drug that can help with depression as well. I want to talk a little bit about anti-anxiety medications and rebound anxiety. Rebound anxiety is when you are on medication and then you come off of it. And what happens is that once you've stopped taking your medication, in that short time frame, possibly between another medication, your anxiety becomes worse. It's almost as if you had the floodgates of anxiety being held back by your medication. And now that those meds are gone, your anxiety comes back twice or maybe three times as bad as it used to be. I have a very good friend who suffers from a social anxiety disorder. And he has said that sometimes he needs to change prescriptions because he doesn't like the side effects or he just doesn't think it's working as well. And so he'll ask his doctor and they'll put him on something new, but then he has to first come off his original anti-anxiety medication. And so he does, and then he has to slowly get started on the next prescription. And he has told me that that period between medications, he will have the worst anxiety he has ever experienced in his life. It's known as rebound anxiety. Other therapies that we have used that are considered biological are things like ECT, or electroconvulsive therapy. Side effects include memory problems. Uh, usually what happens is you will have a blackout period where you don't remember uh, what happened before the uh, procedure, during the procedure, of course, because you're unconscious, and after the procedure. What's really interesting about this is uh, ECT used to be done compulsively, so we would force people to go through with it. Now, it is only done as a last resort. You must sign up for it, so you have to be a willing volunteer for it. And uh, what happens with ECT is we will sedate you, we will slowly put you to sleep, we will strap you down, we will put a mouth guard in your mouth so you don't bite your tongue off accidentally, and we'll put these little electrical nodes up to your brain and send you a small electrical pulse. And what this does is it's essentially like turning your brain off and on again. Uh, and it's been proven very effective in helping many people that are struggling with depression when therapy and medications are having no effect. So it is absolutely a last resort. Another uh, method we might use is psychosurgery. Uh, sometimes we might do intracranial stimulation where we uh, take a small device and insert it into your brain in order to directly stimulate specific sections of your brain that might be overproducing certain uh, neurotransmitters and medication once again is not working. That has also been used in very extreme cases of depression. And there's also prefrontal lobotomy. So a lobotomy is when we take an ice pick, essentially, a sharp needle-like instrument, and we insert it either through your nostril or through your eye socket, just past your eyebrow or your eyeball. And we go into your frontal lobe of your brain and we insert this needle there and then we jiggle it around and then we take it out and what do you know you feel much better uh, but you don't actually feel much better in fact you become a vegetable uh, this is almost entirely n panned by professionals these days we don't really do it anymore um, What's ironic is that the guy who came up with lobotomies would do these for almost any reason. And he uh, believed that it would reduce aggression in his clients. And it, they definitely changed. They weren't as aggressive because most of them became vegetables. Uh, they just, you know, stayed in a chair and just kind of drooled on themselves now because of all the damage that he had just done to their frontal lobe. Ironically, he learned that he was wrong about it decreasing aggression when one of his former patients shot him. So we don't really do lobotomies anymore. And that is pretty much it for therapies. So please make sure that you're getting all of your assignments done by the due date, and I will see you next time for the next lecture.